candle lights it bright. As we are worshiping today, that last song, You Are Holy. And down here, the Lord's given me a vision. You know, what I saw in this vision was this wall. We were walking along this wall, and we finally hit the corner of the wall, and we turned. And, I, and to my great delight, <laughs> I saw Jesus right around the corner, and he was going like this around the corner. He goes, come on, come on. You're turning a corner right now. I turned the corner, and on the side of this wall was the cross. It was just a little teeny thing about that high. And as I kept walking up the, this, up this uh, what looked like I was walking up a hill, the cross was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger till it was like three stories high. And I turned around and looked, I realized I wasn't walking up. The cross was just getting bigger. I wasn't walking uphill. The cross was just getting bigger. I was just getting close to the cross, and it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the Lord is saying, don't worry, my brothers and sisters. You have turned a corner this day in the mighty name of Jesus. And I've been there, hallelujah. I've been waiting to escort you around the corner, hallelujah, to take you up into a closer walk with me. And the, and the cross, hallelujah, the cross which has been ignored in the body of Christ for so many years is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The message of the cross, hallelujah, will be your salvation. And I saw when we got to the top of the hill, it actually it wasn't, it was the level. And I saw the water, the water and the blood flowing out of him and flowing down into the, down into the valley, hallelujah, into the valley of Tucson. The Lord said, we turned the corner, hallelujah, and his blood and his water, the water is his love, the love that poured out, that Jesus had died of a broken heart, and he poured it out to his sons and daughters, hallelujah, and he is saying, go, go in the love of God, hallelujah, from out of your hearts, the message, from out of your hearts, the message shall flow to a deep and dark and lonely and miserable people, hallelujah. And they shall, when they see the love, when they see the love, when they see the love, they will open wide their hearts. And to me, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So flow, river, flow. Flow, river, flow. Amen. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we have turned a corner. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, when Bob and Carolyn asked me to talk today, and she asked me on the phone, the first thing that came to my head was, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> what am I going to say, you know? And uh, so Jan and I really went to prayer about it. And I don't want to speak about something that so many of the prophets are speaking of what's going to happen in 2024 over America. And so it's like, but I don't, I don't want to talk about what's going to happen to America. What the Lord's heart right now for the message I want to give, what's happening to us, amen. What's happening to us as a people? What's happening to past and church, amen. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So what is God doing to past and church in 2024? Now, I want to keep, I want to, keep to my script here because... I don't got that much time, and I don't want to go over. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right. And I don't want to get political either today. I don't want to be political, you know, except to say this. When are we going to stop looking to our government to, to solve all our spiritual problems? Amen. And besides, revival is not going to come from the White House. It's going to come from my house, amen? Amen. It's not going to come out of the over room. It's going to come out of the upper room. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, that's enough political. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What I want to, say, want to talk about, what is happening to us as a body of Christ? And there's two, two points I want to share with you. 
two points that the Lord's given me. And n- number one point is sometimes when the Lord wants me to get something, really get something from him, he'll cause me to go through an experience. He'll cause me to see something in the natural. And, and when I go through that experience, when I see that thing, that it has a message to me. It's, it becomes like a metaphor. And it's kind of like, remember when the, the Lord told Jeremiah, go to the house uh, of the, well, the potter. Go to the potter's house, and there will cause you to hear my word. So that's what easily becomes like a, like a metaphor. And so this story that I want to tell you actually happened to Jan and I. Uh, probably like four years ago, something like that. And this, this experience that we went through has really stuck for me, and it's got a message in it that I want to share with you. Amen? And so what happened was Jan and I had the, the opportunity, the pleasure of having a single mother living in our house. And she didn't have a place to stay, so we let, we, we let her stay at our house for a while. And after Sunday, and it was a winter day, okay, after Sunday worship, Sunday service, we went up to the Mount Lemon, and it, it had snowed that weekend, so there was snow all over the place. And as we got up there, up there about halfway up, you know, all the vistas they have, they have up there, you can stop them. So we pulled over one of those vistas, got out of the car, and we were just taken in the beauty of what we were seeing with all the snow and the, and the the landscape, you know, and the, the scenery there. And we're just standing there and watching that vista. She had her little daughter with her. I forgot to tell you, she had a little, a little daughter. And so we're all watching it and just getting caught up into the, the beauty of it until I turned my left. And I saw this little girl. She had wandered off to the side of the vista, and she was on her butt sliding down the snow, sliding on the snow. And, and to my horror, I run, I run over there, and I grabbed a hold of her, and, it, and she was about three feet away from the edge of the cliff. Unbeknownst to her, she didn't know that she was you know, getting ready to go over the edge. I went over and grabbed a hold of her underneath her armpits, picked her up out of there, and she started screaming. <laughs> she started screaming because I was ruining her fun. You know, and her little legs were shaking like this, you know, trying to get away from me, you know. But I didn't, I didn't let go. I grabbed a hold of her, and I, I grabbed her, and I brought her to a place of safety. And they, even then, she was still mad at me, <laughs> you know, and yelling at me, saying no such kind words, a little three-year-old, you know. And so I... I'm just angry, this anger got up inside me, and I, I grabbed her by the back of, the, of her coat, took her over to the edge of the cliff, and I forced her to look down. I said, do you see where you were going? Do you see where you were headed? And then I pulled her back to that and then put her back to safety. Even then, even then she still was mad at me. <laughs> kicking with her legs and kicking me. You know, finally she gave her back to her mother and said, here, this belongs to you. <laughs> you know? And uh, a little while later, the Lord showed me, I'll let you go through that experience. There's a message in what I wanted you to grab a hold of by that. And I said, what is it, Lord? And he says, you know, my people, they really, they like to pretend that I'm not watching. Isn't that the truth? I like to pretend that I'm not watching. But it's a good thing that I am watching. Because if I wasn't watching, you would end up in destruction. Thank God (laughs) that Jesus has his eye on us. And here's what the Lord was saying to me. In Hebrews... Chapter 12, verse 5. My son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord. That's what she was doing, right? Do not despise the chasing of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. 
Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. See, our problem is, our problem, we just want to have our fun. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. We just want to have our fun. Yeah. You know, pleasure, sin is pleasurable for a season, it's true. But afterwards, where does it lead? Over the cliff. Thank God that he's watching over us, that we don't go over the cliff. Amen? The Lord showed me there's two ways to learn, to learn something. The first way is the falling down method. We can learn by falling down method, but that hurts. Yeah. And the second way is to receive wise counsel and live method. A little child basically has to learn a lot by the falling down method, doesn't he? And he has to be trained by a loving parent over and over and over again until he finally gets it into <laughs> how to walk in safety, amen? But the verse in the Bible that says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, and I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We shouldn't always have to learn it the hard way. Isn't that the truth? We shouldn't. As we grow up, we, you get to the point where we don't have to learn the hard way. Our Heavenly Father says to do something, you do it. Amen? And uh, anyhow, I was worshiping one, after this. I was worshiping one day, just minding my own business with my, my favorite music. And the Lord speaks, you know, the Lord can interrupt you when you're worshiping. That's why you should worship, you know. And the Lord can really speak to you when you're worshiping, you know. And it's because your heart is open. I'm worshiping the Lord. It was my, my music that I like. And all of a sudden, Jesus said, Dave, prove to yourself that you love me. I go, what? Who said that? <laughs> prove, to your, you know, prove to yourself that you love me. So I was asking, well, show me in the Bible what you're talking about, Lord. In, in John 14, 21, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. See, that's the true test if you're loving God. Is he, has he told you to do something? He said to me, David, when I tell you to do something, do you do it? Do I tell you to stop doing something? Do you stop it? And I go, Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And I, and I said to him, I don't love you more than I love you. I had to come to the stark reality that I don't love him more than I love him. So my cry was, Lord, grow me up. Grow me up, Lord Jesus. And that's what the Lord's going to do. Amen. Here's the word that the Lord gave to me. I want to give it to, you, to all of us because it's good for all of us. Amen. Take heart, my sons and daughters, for my eyes are upon you. I am watching over you. It looks like God was watching over that little girl. I am watching over you. My saving hands are upon you. Underneath you are the everlasting arms. I am able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before me with exceeding joy. I am going to grow you up. I put that in bold letters. I am going to grow you up. Amen. I will not leave you to your own devices. For you are my workmanship. You are my workmanship, created unto, unto good works, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I thank God we have a Savior. I think we have a Father that always is watching out for us. And his, his, he is relentless. We like that song. His love is relentless. And his relentless love is going to mold us and make us into the sons of the living God, mature sons of the living God, hallelujah. When he says, go, go run over there, Dave, and talk, talk to that person. He needs to know about my love, hallelujah. Now stop doing that thing that you've been doing for years. It's really getting in the way of us. It's getting in the way of between you and me. You know, I was at the, my addiction was movies. You know, and I would movie hop. I would go to the I'm confessing, okay. <laughs> I would go to the movies, and, and I would Movie hop to like four or five different movies. 
And all of a sudden, I went to, right at the end of my movie hopping, I went into this movie called Pokemon. Anybody ever seen the Pokemon movie? And I was in there all by myself. I was in that big theater all by myself watching the Pokemon movie. And I know that was the only one there because when I went in there, you know, there wasn't, that was the only one there. And all of a sudden, I was halfway through the movie, I heard this voice behind me over here. And it says, David, what are we doing here? <laughs> I looked around. <laughs> Somebody creeped in the back door or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't nobody in there. Aren't you glad the Lord doesn't leave us alone when we're going astray? And then and he will speak to us. So I got up out of there. Yeah, well, yeah what is a 55-year-old man doing sitting in a watching a Pokemon movie anyhow, you know. So I got up out of there, you know, and and that that was the start of my breaking the Lord breaking my movie addiction. Amen. And he's still working on it. Hallelujah. I am got a totally total victory yet, but I, I'm a whole lot better than it anyhow. I gotta go on here. I'm getting off course here. Okay. Number two, the second point that the Lord wants me to share today is it actually happened in my own backyard. Let me get a drink of water here. As I was sitting in, it was like a, a spring day. It just got done raining. And I loved the atmosphere. Everybody loved the atmosphere after it rains in the desert. And I was sitting in my back porch on a chair and just enjoying, you know, the glory of it. And I'm just sitting, and all of a sudden, I look up, and there's this telephone wire on the back of our alley. And these two doves flew up on, the, on top of the, the wire. And they were, like, maybe two feet apart from each other. And I'm sitting here watching it, and they're going, they're, you know how birds hop on a wire? They were hopping on the wire like this. All of a sudden, they're right next to each other, and they started necking. I've never seen two doves necking before. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, this is really interesting, you know. And so I'm watch, watching this, and they're in love. See, my point is they're in love, okay. And all of a sudden, this black, other blackbird, I don't know if it was a pigeon or what, that other blackbird came over there, and landed right next to the what I assume is the male, the male dove, because he was a little bit bigger than the other dove. And he, was, he landed right next to that that guy, and he was trying to get over to the other and attack the other other dove and destroy it. But this the male dove got up there of against against him, and the two of them got up in the air and they were fighting. Ever seen them two birds fighting in the air? Man, it was like. They were just like, feathers were going everywhere, you know. And, and it probably only lasted like 20 seconds. But it was very, a very vicious fight. And I imagine that this bird was, was doing everything he could to keep that blackbird away from his wife. <laughs> Amen. And while, while he was busy fighting off the blackbird, the, the female bird flew over to her trees, right, sitting right next to her in our backyard to the right. And she was over there just waiting. And after the fight, the dove was just landed and the blackbird took away, took off. And he was looking around and finally he saw her. And they flew over to the tree. And there they were in the tree next to my house. And they just picked up where they left off, you know. <laughs> and so it was like, and the message, because here's the message. I want to get on this. Satan was the blackbird. Amen. Satan is the blackbird. And what is he trying to destroy? He hates relationships. Satan hates all relationships, God given relationships. He hates he hates intimacy. He's and he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy your relationship you have with God or wife, or son, or daughter, or brother, or sister, or friend. He hates relationships, because he knows relationships is from God. 
And he wants to take down the whole church. This is what the Lord, he wants to take down the church. And how is he going to do it? By destroying relationships. If he can get in between a relationship and cause a wedge in between whatever one it is, whether it's husbands or wives, and the Lord revealed it to me yesterday at the men's meeting. As we were worshiping, the Lord gave me the majority of the, of the men in, in this room are struggling with broken relationships with their sons or daughters. And when it came to the time for us to pray, three, and the Lord confirmed it. Three out of the four guys that we were praying, I was praying at my table, they had broken relationships with their sons or daughters. And so we spent our time praying. We spent our time praying to heal those relationships. Amen. And so, and here's the good news. The tree it represented the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's where they flew. Hallelujah. They flew into the, the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's the place of our safety and victory. For we, we have overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we do not lives our, live our lives, we do not love our lives even unto death. Amen. You see, the cross is always our divine starting place. And it doesn't matter what the devil may do. We can always come back to the cross and start all over again. Amen. And I was feeling that today. Hallelujah. I was feeling the Lord has given us a brand new start all over again. Turn in the corner. Here we go. Amen. And that's how Paul, the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, never loses its power. You know, we like to sing that song. But when we go through something, hallelujah, even as a people or individual, then, then we begin to, to take it for ourselves for real. Then it begins to take some weight upon our lives, hallelujah. And that's the times when we need it the most, hallelujah. When we become our weakest, that's when his strength comes in, hallelujah. And what is the strength? What is the strongest substance in the universe? What is the strongest piece of wood in the universe, hallelujah. The strongest substance is the blood of Jesus Christ that flows every single day. Hallelujah. The strongest piece of wood, hallelujah, that can smash the devil in your life is the cross of the living God. Hallelujah. And we can come every day. As a matter of fact, we should come every day because then he say, draw near, hallelujah, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having your spirit your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and your body washed with pure water. We come to the throne of grace, hallelujah, where the blood of Jesus comes and cleanses us from all evil. And we can get up all brand new and start all over again, hallelujah, because his mercies are now new every morning, hallelujah, new every morning. How great is thy faithfulness, oh God, my Father, amen. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. So my main message today is the relationship cure. God wants to cure relationships. Amen. So, so what is what is his cure? What is the relationship cure? Do you think the Bible has an answer in that? <laughs> you think it has an answer in the Bible? That's we have we have a place we can go. This is what I want to say first. There's no hiding place. There's no hiding place in the body of Christ to hide your faults and shenanigans. And you can you can decide what your shenanigans is, okay? <laughs> For if one person suffers, don't we all suffer? That's why James says, confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. You know, some lady in our, our service, she said, the body of Christ has its own immunity system. It really does have its own immunity. This is why the devil is trying to attack the unity. That's why he's trying to attack the relationships, because it's through the relationships that the immune system flows. Every, every We're all different pieces of body, amen? 
And it's, it's the joints where the grace of God flows. Hallelujah. And the devil wants to go in there and get someone to cut his arm off and go somewhere else. Now, I, told, I heard one guy where I, I worked at, he said, I don't, I don't need to go to a church. I can go up into the mountain and just get, have some relationship with God. I can commune with him up in the mountain, the beautiful trees and beautiful sky. And I thought, well, that, that's pretty good, but it's pretty easy to be a tree lover. It's pretty easy to be a tree hugger. Um, I can hug a tree for a day and a half, and it won't hurt me. <laughs> but to get back into the body of Christ where someone can actually do damage to you and hurt you, then it takes some growth, hallelujah. It takes some growing. <laughs> it takes some getting up and forgiving. Hallelujah. That's where your truth, that's where you start growing by leaps and bounds if you stay committed to your relationship. Stay committed to your church. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, that was off. <laughs> okay. Let me get back to the message here. Hallelujah. He says, there's no hiding place. Um, Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Purge out the old leaven. So my question, how, how do you purge out the old leaven? Well, you purge out the old leaven by putting in some new leaven. You purge out the old leaven of independent spirit with a spirit of faithfulness and loyalty. You purge out the spirit of stubbornness and rebellion with a spirit of a broken and contrite heart. Amen. Amen. So now I'm getting to the verse. <laughs> I'm, it's amazing. You know, sometimes the, the word of the Lord is like, kind of like yeah, that... It's kind of like a, a plumbing supply store that you drive by every day, and you don't even notice it. So all of a sudden, your house springs a leak. And that plumbing supply store that you were just ignoring day by every day, it becomes something very special. <laughs> you become very uh, familiar what's inside that plumbing supply store. And so the word of God is like that. You can go on like happily, and all of a sudden, some tragedy happens to your life. Some incident happens to your life. Hallelujah. And then you're looking for some answers. And the Lord begin to reveal to you out of his word the answers. Hallelujah. So our situation now is really, the devil is trying to destroy our relationship. But the Lord has an answer. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. The Lord has an answer has an answer right here in the Bible, hallelujah. I, I glossed over this scripture a thousand times. Oh, maybe not a thousand, maybe a hundred times. But lately, the Lord has really been bringing this scripture to my, to my attention. I want to bring it to your attention. Go ahead, Robert, can you put that up there? This is 1 Peter 1, 22. <coughs> Now, I really want to break this down. I don't want to just gloss over this today. There's so, I began to read this. There's so much wealth, so, so much power, so much beauty in this one verse. This is from Peter, by the way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go through this whole scripture one piece at a time. Okay, so we can really get it, what it means, okay? The first word is seeing. What does that mean, seeing? It says, make sure that you actually have evidence of this in your life. What I'm about ready to tell you, I want you to make sure that you actually see it, you have it working in your life. Don't just gloss over it with the mental. Don't just give it mental assent. Make sure you see this in your life. Seeing you, okay, next one. Seeing you have purified your souls. That phrase right there, in a nutshell, is inner healing. Seeing you have purified your souls. We need some inner healing. Our relationships, and for that to happen, our relationships need some inner healing. God's going after it. 
Next, next phrase, in obeying the truth. This is how your healing is realized. The inner healing that we need, this is how it's realized, by obeying the truth. The word truth. Where does truth come from? Well, he answers it in the next phrase, through the spirit of the living God, amen? Through the spirit, that's where truth comes. So, let me just give you an example. Uh, when I was a, a young baby Christian, I didn't know I had so much fear of man. There was a stronghold in my life. And my, when my first wife, we'd have people over to the house. And they'd be sitting in my living room. And I'd be sitting there with them. And she'd have to go to the kitchen or to, a, to the bathroom or something. And when she would leave the room, I would go into a panic. That's how, that's how bad it was. When I was left alone with people, and I would go into a panic. And the Lord began to show me that that is a fear of rejection. And I didn't get, start getting rid of it until I became a Christian. And, and the Lord began to speak to me. And his, the Lord will put you in the press, amen, to make sure that you get your healing. For some reason, I don't know why, they asked me to be an elder at the church where I used to go and do a, do a, a house group, just kind of like we are, our, our life groups that we have here. And I was sitting there with uh, probably about 15 people in the group, and these two guys, two young whippersnappers, just gotten saved not too long ago, okay, they're sitting just to my right, and and I'm actually talking, you know, trying to give my message. And they're over there just talking to each other. Hey, you know, I don't even know what they're talking about. But for me, that was being pretty rude. I'm trying to get the message out, and they're, they're right next to me talking. And instead of, I didn't have the maturity of just gently tell them, hey, give me a chance here, you know. I actually got mad at them. You know, there's fight or flight. I'm a flight kind of a guy. When I, when I came into a situation that's threatening, I'll end up fighting. Yeah, well, uh, you know, that's, that's the way I used to be, okay? I still like a fight, but I don't fight the same way. I fight on my knees, and, you know, this is how I fight my battles. I love that song. And, you know, so I got mad at them, and I told them to get the heck out. <laughs> I told them to leave. Get out. And then I just turned to everybody else, and I said, everybody, get out of here. Get out of my house. You know? And I went to my backyard, and I knew there was something wrong. <laughs> I had the feeling that there was something wrong. And the, and the Lord spoke very sovereignly to me. He said, David, trust me. And that just sunk right down in my heart. And that was the start of my inner healing. You see, when I was growing up, and my family, the, our family was like constant competition. I had, I had one brother and three sisters, an absent father and an angry mother. So I, a constant, constant competition. And so and basically, I, I got raised by my brothers and sisters who didn't like me very much. So I, I brought that into my, li my life, that people are not safe. I don't care <laughs> where you come from, people are not safe. And Lord, the Lord saw that. The Lord saw that affliction. And I made, I made him my Lord, and he made me his son. Hallelujah. That means that's when the, my healing started. When the, Jesus, I'm going to do something about that. Hallelujah. He gave me a loving wife. Hallelujah. I'd get mad at her, and I would say, I want a divorce. And that was just the fear of rejection, rearing his ugly head up again. And, and what really was the key truth, remember, it's the truth. It's the truth. Seeing you have purified your, body, your souls in obeying the truth. The truth the Lord gave to me was in Ephesians, which says, I have made you accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. He has made me. Who, who made me accepted in the beloved? My heavenly Father <laughs> made me accepted. Not my brother. He didn't make me accepted in the beloved. I never had a brother that that didn't fight with. 
I never didn't have a sister that I hated. But Jesus, I have made you accepted in the beloved. And if you don't accept me, that's your problem. Thank God. That's really your problem. And if I don't accept you, that's my problem. Because our Heavenly Father has made us all accepted in the beloved. And that's the foundation of the truth that started getting down in my heart. Can I say that I had the victory all the way, 100%, but I was way over there. Now I'm over here. I'm, I've made some movement. Hallelujah. I'm getting, I'm growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I used to be so afraid that I could hardly talk to people. Hallelujah. Can you tell I've gotten over that? <laughs> You know, I wake up in the morning and start I preach in the gym. I pre I preach the gym. Finally, she says, "Dave, you need to go to church. <laughs> church. Find somebody else to preach to." Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so so that's that's how we get better, so we can love. Amen. We have to get better. The truth makes us better. Makes us whole. We get a hold of that. We can get rid of those things that afflict us. And now here's the next word, unto. Unto, right there, unto. That that word right there is, is like the, the fine print. You got to read the fine print. That word, the Lord said, what that word unto means. It means if you do this, then you can go unto that. And where's that? So many of us are, are looking and trying to find our ministry, our calling. What's our destiny? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you, how many times have you asked God, what do you want to, me to do? Hallelujah. He's saying, this is what I want you to do. Have unfeigned love. Amen. Let that be our highest calling, Amen. church of the living God. Let that be our highest calling. Amen. Hallelujah. And if you do this, hallelujah, you, you make unfeigned love your goal, your number one goal. Don't worry. Don't worry about your destiny. Don't worry about your future. Don't worry about your kids. Hallelujah. I'm bringing them back. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. The kingdom shall flow through a heart that has this goal. Amen. So what is unfeigned love? That word unfeigned means genuine, sincere, and real. And it's very fitting that Peter was the one that gave us this message. Very fitting. You know, I love Jesus the way he does inner healing. He doesn't, he doesn't make an odd. Uh, Dave, I need to make an appointment. You can, can you meet me in my office at, at 1237 uh, next Tuesday. Uh, well, we'll deal with your issues then. You know, no, Jesus heals us on the fly. He heals us as we walk with him and talk with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he, and he tells us, hallelujah, he makes sure that we get our healing, inner healing. And Peter's the one, the right one to give this message because we all know what happened with Peter the night when he denied Jesus three times. Remember what he said to Jesus before he went to the cross? He said, I will go. With, I'll. Yeah. He was talking, pointing to the other disciples. They may not follow you to death, but I will follow you. Do you see the ego? Do you see the, the flesh raising up? It was, it was admirable. And this is what I love about Jesus. He's totally functional. He won't answer the way you would like to. <laughs> he, he didn't say, oh, Peter, that's, that's, I, see, I see your passion, Peter, that's, that's good. That's admirable, Peter. No, no, he didn't say that. He says, Peter, will you go to death with me? I say to you, before the cock crows, you shall deny that you even know me. Three times. And that killed him. That took uh, Peter's ego. You know, Jesus always tells you where you're at so he can take you from where you're at to where he wants you to be. And Peter had this humongous ego that needed to be slashed. 
I call it prime, prime rib flesh. <laughs> full of the good intentions. Full of own strength. Especially when the little girl, can you imagine? Poor Peter had to, you got to be, you got to cry for Peter, you know. When the little girl confronted him, he ran away from a little girl. When that happened, I think, that as he was running, his humongous ego began to just fall off of him like dirt coming off of him. And finally, he came to the place where he could, with no strength at all left, fell, fell at his feet. And two days later, three days later, he had this wonderful encounter with Jesus where Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And I believe, why did Jesus ask him three times? I'm, I believe, and there's lots of theories, you know, and this is my theory. He kept asking him, do you love me? So finally, Peter would get that right down into the middle of his heart, right down where he lives who he really is. And he began to get grieved at Jesus. His spirit man got caught up in what he was saying. Jesus, you know I love you. Hallelujah. There Peter was being the real Peter. And that's what Jesus was looking for, the real man, the real Peter. And Peter had to go through this because he knew that he was going to be the number one apostle, the number one first uh, pastor for the church, and he had to get rid of that, get him ready so he could stand and for years and years love the body of Christ, hallelujah. And Jesus gave Peter only one job, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And I love what Jesus said right out there. He says, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself. There it is. There's Peter's religion right there. And that religion had to be slashed to the ground by the word of the living God. You know, the Bible says the word of God is like a hammer that breaks in pieces the rock. And that was the part of Peter that had to be broken into pieces. So he could, Jesus could put him back together and be the apostle. The church leaders say, he was not worthy to be crucified, standing straight up like, his, like Jesus. He wanted, he wanted to be crucified upside down. What an unfailing love. Hallelujah. What Peter, good intentions, what he wanted to with his own flesh, God accomplished in the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. Amen. Unfeigned love of the brethren. So let's see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Here's the part also, pure heart. What is a pure heart? A pure heart is without any ulterior motives, without any agendas. You just come just remember, I love Billy Graham, his altar calls. He'd always say, come as you are. Don't put on airs. Don't pretend you're cool. Come, come as you are. With all your afflictions and your pain and your sorrow, come as you are, and the Lord will make you a brand new person. Hallelujah. Fervently, the last word in this verse. What does fervently mean? Fervently means fire, with God's fire burning on the inside of your heart. Song of Solomon says, many waters cannot quench my love, nor can the floods drown it. Hallelujah. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. And see, this is what Peter had to get, get in his head. I don't, you try it with your good intentions, try and prove your love to me. No, 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 no. It's not going to happen that way. I have, to, I have to indulge you in 
and immerse you into my love, hallelujah, and then your response will be godly, hallelujah. Your response will be out of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. So Peter, Peter's religion had to get smashed so he could fervently love with the love of the Lord. Amen. Okay, uh, Robert, the next verse, 23. So here's the question I'm asking God. <laughs> wow, what a, what, was, what a magnificent and powerful and beautiful calling that's going to be accomplished through the body of Christ. How in the world are we going to do this? How in the world is this going to happen? Because Peter wouldn't just fool us around, fool around with this and write this down on, on pen and paper if he didn't want it to happen to us. Hallelujah. <laughs> so my question is, how is it going to happen? If we try and try, try and love, it, come, it comes out, it gets old, okay? Here's what he says. Being born again. Thank you, Jesus. See, my brothers and sisters, we got something stronger than any flesh. We got something more powerful living right on the inside of us. It's the word of the living God. Let me continue. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, nor of incorruptible, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower of love falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Amen. There's our salvation right there. And it's inside of us. Hallelujah. It's inside of us. So the, Lord's, the Lord wants to take out the rocks that are hindering the flow. Wants to take out the affliction. That's why he says, confess your faults one to another. I got ten whole minutes left. One minute. I got one minute. I got one minute. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, U of A won their game last night in the last two minutes, didn't they? <laughs> okay. In closing. Wait. Oh, this is a this is the kicker. That last phrase on verse twenty five. Verse 25, the last verse, here's the last gazinga. Oh, this one we skipped on. And he says, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. What is Peter saying there? You know what he's saying there? You got to get this word first before you can preach the gospel. Whoa! You got to get this working because this is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the word by which the gospel is preached. Whoa. We got to get this. Amen? Amen. We got to get this. Why aren't they flooding the back doors? Why aren't they coming in here? We got to be real, guys, and that's what God's saying. We got to start getting real with each other. Hallelujah. Real with God. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. You know, I don't want to go to a church where we just come together on a sun, Sunday morning and we, we're, all, we got this, we're all crippled in one way or another. And, and it, my brother says, Dave, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Oh, that was a good sermon today. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> no. Who wants to deal with things? Hallelujah. Confess your faults one to another. Amen. So in closing, I can safely say that relationships are the most important thing in the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen all over this place? Amen. Amen. Relationships are the most important thing. And I want to end with this, if I can, Bob, a very short story. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one very short story that happened to me shortly after I got saved. The Lord showed me that relationships are the most important. I had, growing up, <clears throat> my parents decided to bring my grandmother because she was getting up in age to live with us. And me being the ornery little cuss, stubborn and rebellious, doing my own thing, 
I didn't get along with my grandmother. And to my knowledge, she was the only Christian at that point, the only Christian in the household. And I wonder, now I know why, I, I didn't get along with her. Deep down, she was a Christian, and I wasn't. So it was light clashing against darkness. Anyhow, I didn't get along with her, and this one time, I can't even remember what, what I was fighting about, but she had me on the ground. I was like a nine-year-old kid. She had me on the ground. I was yelling it, and I'm on the ground. She's on top of me, and I grab a hold of her arm like this, and I grab her so hard that I actually bruise her arm. And after that was over, she squealed on me to my mother, and my mother brought me over, and my grandmother was sitting right there in the living room watching. My mother br brought me over and gave me a spanking right in front of her. And it wasn't so much the spanking, it was the way she did it. It was so dishonoring. So ugly. And that didn't bother me. I knew that I was being a snob. I knew that I deserved the spanking. But I was watching my grandmother over on the couch. And she was just watching it. And I could feel, I remember I could feel the hatred actually come right into my heart for my grandmother. And after that, years later, I got saved. And it couldn't have been two months later after I got saved. I'm sitting on my couch by myself. And I ain't getting your brothers and sisters. It was like my grandmother came in the room and stood in front of me. And I don't know if it was a projection of my own mind or it was actually her or is this something that the Lord let me see. I don't know which one of those. You know, Paul says, I don't, I've been up and I didn't, I didn't know if, if I was in the body or out of the body. So I didn't, but all I knew was, oh, it's like I was feeling her presence. And she says, are you okay? She was, she was concerned for me. Are you okay? And I broke my heart. I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I was a snob. I'm sorry for holding this against you. For so many years, yeah, I can and I can remember when she was about ready to die. She was trying to make up with me, and there was a party at our house one day. And she walked up, the old lady walked up to me, and I was a strong football player. Okay, I was in my full strength. I had all my flesh <laughs> working. She was walking up to me, and she was trying to hug me, and she hugged me, and I just go like that and I did not let it come in see she was trying to make reconciliations with me but it wasn't until that day after I got saved now God could speak right into my heart now God could deal with me and get that out of my heart hallelujah and, and we my grandmother and I we made it right with each other on that night our relationship was healed that night so here's my point. Why am I telling you this story? If it was important for me to be in right relationship with my dead mother, my dead grandmother, how much more is it important for us to be in right relationship with our living relatives? Amen? Amen? So that's it. God's at work. We've turned a corner. 